Uncovering a killer's mistake can lead detectives to unexpected places. Those who take the lives of others may work hard to remain masked, camouflaged. It's a classic Sunday night in England, and a local arrives for a drink. He went to a local pub where he sat and ordered a ploughman's, had a chat with the landlady, and drank an orange juice and lemonade. Shortly after, the man popped his coat on, went to the bathroom. And he dried his hands on a paper towel, which he put in the bin. The biggest mistake Paul Hutchinson made was that he didn't have a crystal ball. He couldn't anticipate the advances in forensic science that would bring about his undoing. An hour or so earlier, Colette Aram failed to turn up as expected at her boyfriend's house in a nearby village. The family reported her missing. Colette was such a, a genuinely beautiful person that she wouldn't let anybody worry about her. The paper towel and the missing girl became part of a 22-year murder mystery. Every investigation is like a jigsaw, each piece offering new evidence as a picture of a suspect emerges. But which one will reveal the killer's mistake? Why Claire? She's beautiful Claire. Why her? Keyworth, Nottinghamshire, in the English Midlands, a village which has grown slowly to become a small town, safe, dependable. If you like village life, then Keyworth was an ideal place to live. Picturesque, low crime rate, just a lovely, rural, idyllic place to be. Keyworth is a lovely village. It was where I grew up. I, I, you know, it a beautiful village and in the 80s when we were growing up it was um, one of the safest places. You just went everywhere and did your own thing and um, a lot of people know each other, um, friendly and just a lovely place to grow up. Karen Willis, like so many 16 year olds in 1983, spent Sunday glued to the radio. What would be top of the pops that week? It was a normal Sunday evening and uh, we had listened to the Top 30. After finding out it was Culture Club and Karma Chameleon, she planned on a date with her boyfriend and set off on foot to his house. Walking everywhere was never an issue. Um, you know, you would go anywhere and everywhere by foot and felt comfortable doing so. But that night would be different. I um, did my usual, say goodbye to mum and uh, off I trotted to, to the local pub, if you like, you know, in, in the corner to meet my boyfriend. And as I was walking, there was an incident that gave me a little bit of a, a concern. There was a car that had passed by me and I was, I didn't recognise and it was really, really, you know, slightly made me feel anxious, this car, because it sort of like beat me, but I didn't know who it was. It was an unsettling moment for the young woman and it wasn't over. So I carried on walking down the road and then a little bit further down the road, I was again, the same car, beat again. Which made me then think, who are you? It made me slightly anxious and I, I continued down the road as fast as I could because I could see a couple walking together. So I tried to catch up with them. Who was it 
What had just happened? A friend, perhaps, who was saying hello? That would be typical of Keyworth. Karen Willis did catch up with the couple ahead of her, eventually got home safe. Later, she planned on calling her best friend, Colette Aram. They'd met at school. As Colette was growing up, she liked lots of different things. She liked riding, what have you. And, um, but we just had fun. There was no, you know, we were just innocent young children that ha live, were lucky enough to grow up in a lovely area and lucky enough to, to have wonderful parents. And we were just happy children. And Colette was an easy choice for best friend. Colette was a model daughter. She was studious at school. She listened to her parents. They couldn't have wished for a more beautiful girl. She was very considerate and kind and gentle and soft and, and caring. The girls had the same ambition for when they left school. We were both starting to do hairdressing and uh, Colette and I were so excited because we were going to go to college together. Um, she was working in one salon and I was going to work in the other. Feeling confident about their futures, Karen and Colette felt set for life. First job, great place to live and no reason to be worried about a neighbour called Paul Hutchinson. Paul Hutchinson seemed like a completely normal man next door. He was married, he had children, he had a normal job. There was nothing that made him stand out as abnormal or out of the ordinary. Except they should have been worried. Appearances, even in Middle England and places like Keyworth, can be deceptive. They don't come much worse than Paul Hutchinson as a committed sexual deviant in his spare time, he liked to hide out in sheds, watching young girls riding horses while touching himself. This man certainly had sexual problems. He, he had sexual paraphilia. Sexual paraphilia, defined as intense sexual arousal to atypical objects and fantasies, also known as sexual fetishism. He'd hide away in stables and in woods. He got off by watching young girls. In Hutchinson's case, he certainly had a leaning towards very young girls. He liked to spy on them. He liked to look at them and was maybe fantasizing about having sex with them. The farms and fields outside the village gave Hutchinson plenty of opportunity to pursue his perverse pastime all the while remaining unsuspected. He had no previous criminal convictions. A more vile kind of man I struggle to think of. To locals, Paul Hutchinson was a 24-year-old who said he graduated in psychology before training as an electrician and settling early into family life. Sometimes people like Hutchinson make a very good job of hiding their sexual fantasies. There will always be some people who will recognise perhaps the strange behaviours. And sometimes within families, it, it depends how, how much questioning there is. He might have been able to live quite a private life in his own home. Those living near him, as the young married man whose wife had recently had a baby, saw him as a textbook family man. They were completely oblivious to the danger in their midst, a chameleon blending in behind the facade of Keyworth life, respected, unsuspected of anything untoward. Certain criminals are what they are. They steal, they rob, they burgle. So very much what you see is what you get. Not Paul Hutchinson. He wasn't just an ordinary man living an ordinary life. He was somebody who was split, knew that he needed to protect one life to maintain the other life. But deep down in the dark recesses, he lives a very, very different life, unbeknown to everybody, and that's a very dangerous thing.
It was the 30th of October 1983 when Karen Willis had been beeped at by a motorist. Earlier, Paul Hutchinson was doing what Paul Hutchinson did, spying on young girls riding. Colette Aram had been at the stables. When home, she planned a night out. Colette had, had gone to, to meet her boyfriend. Um, so she was going, as we all did, walking to see her boyfriend. He was gonna meet her up Nicker Hill. Um, again, a beautiful place in Geworth where you wouldn't think anything of walking. It was still a mystery to Karen who had beeped at her earlier. As detectives later tried to uncover a killer's mistake, they would want an answer to that mystery. At seven o'clock, a few streets away from Karen, Colette headed out. Around eight o'clock on October 30th, people living on this estate heard the screams of a woman. Locals heard a woman screaming. They also heard a car screeching off. The sound came and went. A brief moment of concern, but explained away perhaps as young people fooling around. Earlier that same day, unbeknownst to anyone, Paul Hutchinson had been indulging himself, ogling girls at the stables. Jane Moncton-Smith helps police forces profile people like Hutchinson. They behave in a very ritualistic way. So they have what you might call a fantasy in their head, which they relive and relive, and that's how they get their kicks. Clearly, with, with somebody like Hutchinson, he's got a very specific ritual in mind. So he'll be looking for a certain type of victim, and he was looking for a young girl. A young girl like Colette Aram, who was on her way to visit her boyfriend. Colette didn't arrive at her boyfriend's, and soon afterwards, the alarm went up. Colette's missing. Something's very, very wrong. It was very out of character for Colette to go missing. Some children do, and, and they do that a lot, but not Colette. This was completely out of character. She would have phoned her mum to say, by the way, I've just popped into Karen's, or I've just popped in, wherever she was going, she would have said. Um, so mum wouldn't worry because she was such a, a kind, considerate person. And that's why we knew so, so quickly that Colette was missing straight away because she didn't arrive and she would have made the phone call. Sometime that night, Colette's family called the police. As a detective, you dread hearing those words, a child has gone missing. Detectives are parents themselves, but they have to suppress all the natural concerns that they might have because they've got a job to do. We've got to find this child. As police arrive at the scene, family and friends convey a picture of Colette that makes it clear she isn't the kind of girl who just disappears. She must be in trouble. Everybody else that was around, I mean, had gone looking for her and, and was searching to find where she'd suddenly disappeared too because it Nothing made sense. But this is serious. This is worrying. We've got to find this girl. The search parameters were set. Start at her home, follow the route to her boyfriend's, fan it out as much as you possibly can, depending on how many resources you've got available. Turmoil, horrendous. While police searched, Karen Willis becomes convinced that the strange car she encountered earlier that evening could give a clue to Colette's whereabouts. The police wanted to know a little bit more about it, but unfortunately, that really, really hurts and still does, the fact that I couldn't give them anything more than the fact that this car had passed me and made me feel anxious. The next day, the community sprung into action. Everybody went out looking for Colette, you know, 
everybody that knew was searching for her. Um, her brother, her mum, her dad, auntie's uncle, everybody, everybody was there trying to find where's Colette because clearly that wouldn't have happened. She would have let us know. The following day, about a mile and a half from the route that she'd followed, Colette's body was found. She had been raped, strangled, and her body had been left in a sexually provocative pose. Colette's brother had to suffer the horror of finding his own sister dead. To this day, I have no idea how he lives and copes with what he saw. Trauma never goes away. Uh, the family every day live with that trauma and it's never going to go away. We, you know, you can say time's, time makes a difference, but it doesn't. It, it's so traumatic what happened. I personally had to break away from any of the information about what had happened to Claire that evening. And that was how I protected myself. I felt guilty that it was Colette. Um, I didn't want, obviously, it to be me, but I, I had so much guilt that, why Colette? She's, you know, she's beautiful Colette. It's, why her? Why anybody? But, yeah. As police searched for clues and the perpetrator, village life in Keyworth, a previously serene and safe space, was turned on its head. Keyworth changed that day. It became a, a different village. It became a village where nobody trusted one another, everybody wanted to know where everybody was, and we weren't allowed to walk the street by myself, and I and didn't want to. We were too frightened. And probably to this day, you know, obviously the children now are growing up, you know, but even as parents, I always make sure I take my children everywhere and, and, and I know that my parents did the same from that day forth. Police were on the hunt for a killer's mistake. Quickly and correctly, they assessed the sequence of events. Colette was abducted from a country lane. She was bundled into a car. Um, she was strangled and she was raped and then her body was dumped in a field. When Colette's parents bid her farewell that evening, they wouldn't have dreamt for a moment that such an appalling thing was going to happen to her. Detectives build a case from the evidence up and what they quickly learned was that a motorist had pestered a young woman in Keyworth and hours later, another young woman had been snatched or perhaps accepted a ride. That theory was quickly ruled out. Colette would never have gone into a car, not in a million years would get Colette have. She would have had to be forcefully. She probably, somebody maybe asked her directions. I don't know how that happened, but clearly she, would have, she wouldn't have, uh, you know, gone into that car without uh, a forceful situation. Unmasking Paul Hutchinson would not be easy. No one suspected the quiet family man. His penchant for perversions were widely unknown, and he'd never escalated to attacking a girl. On the evening of Colette's murder, he behaved as usually as he could. Only about 20 minutes or so after the murder, Paul Hutchinson went to a pub. Where he sat and ordered a ploughman's, had a chat with the landlady and drank an orange juice and lemonade. The barmaid that served him was alarmed by his demeanour. He seemed a bit strange. She really thought something was wrong. Hutchinson used the toilet. And he dried his hands on a paper towel, which he put in the bin. 
The landlady of the generous Britain pub where Hutchinson went that night had noticed something suspicious about the orange and lemonade drinking man and acted after the news of the teenager's murder became public. The landlady called police saying, there was this guy in here and I did notice some blood on his hands. They went to the pub. And they retrieved some items including a paper towel. But one very, very astute detective seized the paper towel that Hutchinson had used. Which had traces of blood and it turned out semen on it. Now back in the 80s, there was no DNA analysis of exhibits. That science just didn't exist. Basically, it was fingerprints and very little else. And even in the late 80s, once fingerprinting had been invented, you needed large amounts of biological specimens to actually be able to generate a DNA profile. That detective had the wherewithal to seize that exhibit, the significance of which wouldn't be realized for over a quarter of a century. How had Paul Hutchinson, the pervert who preyed on horse riding girls, escalated to murder and then had the audacity to calmly go into a pub? With sexual killers, the acts that they get involved in, whereas we look at it as something that would create an emotional kind of explosion for us, we would, we'd feel dreadful afterwards. What they actually feel afterwards is relief. So they are, after that, feeling relieved and will present as probably calmer than they had done in the run-up to that homicide. So he could have gone to the pub and actually, with that feeling of relief, been able to stand there and have a drink and chat to the landlady without looking as if he'd done something absolutely dreadful. The day after the discovery of Colette's body in a field near Keyworth, Paul Hutchinson told his wife that he had a job which would take him away from Keyworth for a little while. Soon he would show a chilling level of confidence that he'd got away with murder. Colette Aram had been murdered and police did not have a suspect. They could not know that her killer had returned to Keyworth from where he had conveniently left on the pretense of working away. Hutchinson was also a cocky character, so I think it's about five weeks after the murder was committed, he actually went back to the village um, and um, had a look around, saw what the police were doing. This was a really serious crime, and he would have known that there would have been a lot of police activity. He'd have been quite concerned that he might have left some evidence behind. After the initial period of having committed that crime, he'll start thinking about the repercussions of that, and sometimes going back to the scene. It, it, people go back for different reasons. I'm sure Hutchinson was enjoying some kind of weird and perverted adrenaline rush not long after the murder. He was probably trying to constrain himself from telling somebody about what he'd done. This, for him, was the pinnacle of his very sad life. If Hutchinson was enjoying the fact that he, a killer, could parade in front of police hunting for a killer, he was about to take his cockiness one stage further. Hutchinson decided that he'd taunt the police. So he wrote them a letter saying words to the effect that you can't catch me. But he was making mistakes that unfortunately wouldn't be discovered for a long, long time. Despite what we see represented in, in lots of television programmes, it's, it's very unusual for somebody who's committed a murder like this to then taunt the police and send letters. It, not only is it an arrogant thing to do, it's an incredibly stupid thing to do because it gives the police another line of potential forensic evidence. We can't know exactly why he wrote that letter. But it's almost as if he wanted some recognition for what he'd done. He, he might have seen it almost as an achievement not to have been caught and he was a he was a kind of a narcissistic person 
He liked to big himself up. He liked to tell people that he was a psychology graduate. He liked people to recognise how clever he was. And that might have been the purpose in sending that letter. Clever enough to know that what evidence he was giving to the police was worthless. Hutchinson had a clean record. Police had this letter um, at that time. They would have been able to do a few tests on it. They could do some handwriting analysis, but you need a suspect to compare the handwriting to. Similarly, they might have been able to recover fingerprints from the letter, but you need, you need, the, uh, you need a fingerprint that matches, so you need Hutchinson's fingerprints to be in a fingerprint database. Not only did police not suspect the local electrician, his own family and friends were equally in the dark. Hutchinson was good at keeping secrets. He went on with life as normal. Depending on his kind of personality profile, depending if he was somewhere on, on the spectrum of, of psychopathy, very often those people do become very good liars because they become very manipulative. And if you tell a really big lie that you can't imagine anyone would lie about, that almost, you know, is your cover. But he may have been somebody who routinely lied anyway. You know, he, he certainly presents a, as that kind of person, so was very used to it. The masquerade of Hutchinson the young family man continued as the hunt for the killer was scaled down. How had he got away with it? The police had blood on a paper towel, possibly left by a suspect. Fingerprints on the letter that he had sent, coldly telling the police they would never catch him. But weeks turned into months, then years, and still no arrest for the murder of Colette. He had made mistakes, but technology advances would be needed to uncover them. If the same crime happened today, one of the obvious first things police would have been able to do was retrieve DNA from Colette's body, from maybe from underneath her fingernails. They'd be able to look at the fibres on her body. They'd be able to maybe look at DNA found on her clothes. Those tools just didn't exist back in 1983. No CCTV, no automatic number plate recognition cameras, no mobile phones and all the evidence that they can give and forensic science was really in its infancy. If you got a fingerprint, you were a very lucky detective. DNA fingerprinting was invented in the mid-80s and started being used towards the end of the 80s. And even then, you needed a large amount of biological material. Today, um, you can just run a swab over a door handle, pick up a couple of cells and generate a DNA profile from those cells. The murder of Colette Aram was to be the first case to appear on a British TV programme called Crime Watch. Colette's mother made an appeal. As a mum, she went to and went on Crime Watch, did so many, you know, everything she could possibly do as a mum to, to, to get him where he needed to be, um, behind bars. Crime Watch was new, it was something different. It gave the police a tool that they'd never had before. Keyworth had a population of around 4,000. The new information in many ways got in the way. Every single man in the community, but for one, was innocent. But they were all suddenly worried about a visit from the police. There were around 1,500 people that might have been potential suspects. There were hundreds of other witnesses to be interviewed. And you know, the cops really didn't have the tools then that they do today. So it was old school. Old school methods, old school tactics. Investigations and interviews that followed the Crime Watch appeal didn't lead to any arrests. But it did make Paul Hutchinson, the killer still living in Keyworth, feel that the net was tightening. Lots of people were getting questioned and interviewed. Hutchinson was alarmed by this, so he concocted a story which he told to his family that he'd got cancer and that he had to go away for treatment. This story was so elaborate that he actually pulled tufts of his own hair out to convince people that those were the effects of the cancer treatment. Hutchinson's cynical portrayal of himself as a cancer victim meant that he could leave his family and the area. By slipping away like that, he managed to evade police questioning. If officers going door-to-door, -door, following up leads from the TV programme, called at his house, 
there was a legitimate reason for him to be away. It's a classic diversionary tactic. Claiming that he had lung cancer is not only a big lie, it's a very specific kind of a lie. And sometimes when people want to avoid being questioned or challenged about something, they will feign some kind of illness so that people will feel guilty about questioning them. So if he's telling his family that he's ill, that's a very specific lie. They're all going to be sympathising with him. He's going to get away with behaviours that he perhaps wouldn't have got away with before. So it's an incredibly good lie to tell. Keyworth again returned to some sort of normality. Karen's friends and family struggled to rebuild their lives. Karen decided to devote herself to her chosen career. It was a mark of honour for her friend. Everything I did, I was determined to do it well. I mean, it was like college, we'd, we'd made so many plans to go together. Um, I worked so hard in college to make sure I, I did really well, but, you know, not just for me, for Glett, you know. And yeah, it was, it was really difficult because I had to, to do the job she was doing in that salon. There's no question, but that's what I had to do. As the years passed, the investigation continued to draw blanks, and eventually Paul Hutchinson returned to the area and picked up his life. He was a killer hiding in plain sight. As the initial heat from the inquiry died down, Hutchinson sort of reintegrated himself into society. He kind of went off radar for a bit, and he started a new life. His first marriage broke down, so he married again. He had more children, including a son called Jean-Paul. He worked as an electrician, a salesman. He even served as a school governor. Despite the witness evidence, forensics and tip-offs from the general public, Paul Hutchinson lived the standard Keyworth life for a man with children, going to work, coming home, accepted by those around him. But time was passing, science was improving, his mistakes would, one day, catch up with him. Fast forward 20 years, police try again. So they have another look at the evidence and they swab that letter that was sent to them, taunting them. They have a look at Colette's clothes and retrieve DNA from her clothing. They also have another look at that paper towel that was found in the pub. From these three sources, they're able to put together a DNA profile of the possible killer. They still have a problem though. They may have a DNA profile of the killer, but they still need to match it to somebody. What mistakes had Hutchinson made? Would he ever be uncovered as the killer? In Britain, a statute of limitations means that some crimes are left unsolved. Burglary, theft, vandalism, the list goes on. As the years pass, the cases are dropped. There's no statute of limitation on murder. The crime remains on the books forever or until solved. Paul Hutchinson may or may not have known that as he went about his normal life in Keyworth. By the time 2008 came round, forensic science had leapt forward enormously some of the exhibits from Colette's case had been examined and DNA profiles had been obtained. Every person that was arrested was now being swabbed as a matter of routine. One such person got arrested for a driving offence, taken to the police station and was swabbed. That young man was called John Paul Hutchinson. A killer's mistake was about to be revealed. His days were numbered. The turning point in this case comes when Hutchinson's son, John Paul, is pulled over for a speeding offence and arrested. A DNA profile is taken, and then they generate this partial hit. There were such advances in forensic sample testing, and especially DNA evidence, which just wasn't around when you know he, he committed that offence. And things have moved forward so much that you don't even need to be yourself 
on the database now for the police to get a match and increasingly we're seeing that where people who've committed offences 20, 30 years ago are now getting that knock on the door which a lot of them must be dreading. So he couldn't possibly have predicted that things would advance in the way that they have. So he was just very unlucky that he managed to keep himself off the DNA database so that that match wasn't made, but he could not control any of his relatives getting onto the database. Like the man arrested on a driving offence in Keyworth. An analysis of his DNA profile showed a lot of similarities with the DNA profile that they'd got from the exhibits around Colette's murder. The dots were beginning to get joined up. Jean-Paul's DNA matches the crime scene DNA profile, not entirely, but enough that that makes them think, hmm, maybe this person is related to the killer. There was a match then to Colette's murder, and it was only a matter of time before he got the knock on the door. Was the family man about to discover that his own son inadvertently would create his father's downfall? The DNA profile was close enough for police to suspect that a family member of the young John Paul Hutchinson was linked to Colette's murder. It couldn't be John Paul, he was too young. Once you've identified that somebody may be a relative of the person who committed the crime, there are other tests, other DNA tests you can do. One of them is Y chromosome testing. So usually when you generate a DNA profile, you're looking at little markers across all of the chromosomes. In this type of test, you're looking just at the Y chromosome. The Y chromosome is what males carry. So females have an X, two X chromosomes, males have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. And that Y chromosome is important because a copy of it has passed down the male line. So Paul Hutchinson's brothers will carry the same Y chromosome. They inherited it from their father. But Hutchinson and his brothers will also be passing that same Y chromosome down to their sons. So when Jean-Paul's Y chromosome is tested, they can then look at other male relatives and get a stronger, stronger idea of whether this person really is related or not. The DNA profile police had from John Paul was a familial match to that found in the paper towel carelessly discarded by a man at the generous Britain pub in 1983. It matched the DNA found on Colette's clothes too. But his father Paul had a reason for that. It wasn't his DNA. He was going to try and lie his way out of it. The police arrested Hutchinson and he spun a yarn. He said the DNA profile that they'd got actually belonged to his brother who was dead. So he was trying to put the blame on him. What he doesn't realise is the police have his dead brother's DNA and it's not a match. So that blew a hole in Hutchinson's story. And there was a fingerprint on the letter that Hutchinson wrote to the police all those years ago. So now, the DNA from Colette's clothes, the DNA from the paper towel in the pub, the fingerprint on the letter, the case against Hutchinson was looking compelling. Once you've used familial DNA testing to identify Paul Hutchinson as the suspect, you then need to do a full DNA profile because familial searching isn't enough to say with certainty this person matches a crime scene profile. So you swab um, Paul Hutchinson's DNA and you generate a DNA profile and you compare that to the profiles from the paper towel and from Colette's clothing and so on and you see that they match. Time was up for the killer of Colette Aram. It was Paul Hutchinson who'd skulked in the stables, a peeping Tom pervert who'd spied on young girls near Keyworth. It was almost certainly Paul Hutchinson who beeped at Karen Willis, who had snatched Colette Aram as she walked to see her boyfriend, who had strangled, raped her, murdered her, and then dumped her body in fields. It was Paul Hutchinson who'd gone to the generous Britain pub, casually ordered an orange and lemonade, washed away blood from his hands before drying them on a paper towel. 
It was Paul Hutchinson who'd lived the lie of being a family man, stand-up citizen, school governor and electrician living in a neat house on a neat row in a neat street of Keyworth. 26 years after the crime, Paul Hutchinson was sentenced to life imprisonment. But that is not the end of the story of the killer who made a mistake. Hutchinson got hold of enough tablets to take an overdose. Annoyingly, he only served a few months of that sentence. He took his own life. I always get extremely irritated by murderers who are allowed to take their own lives in prison. Hutchinson evaded justice while he was alive. He has now been able to evade justice through his death. When he went to prison, he got a life sentence and he probably didn't see much of a life for himself in there. Everything that he'd known, all of the, the, you know, the family network, the stability that he had, had gone. It's very sad for the family because they don't feel that they got justice. But in the end, he was never going to give them justice anyway. And this was his final act of, I'm going to deal with this, I'm going to win, I'm going to have the final say. As criminologists reflect on the murder of Colette Aram and the evasion from justice for decades at Paul Hutchinson, they can now see why he was destined to be captured. Hutchinson actually made quite a lot of mistakes, any of which could have ended with his arrest. He was just lucky that they didn't, really. The sending those letters, for example, was a big mistake. And certainly, when he was arrested, having sent those letters, that wouldn't have helped with his sentencing, because it shows no, no remorse. Um, he couldn't have known about the DNA advances, but even so, going into that pub, talking to the landlady so close to the murder scene, going into that pub with blood on his hands, leaving behind a tissue which had Colette's DNA on it and his DNA on it. That was a big mistake. Hutchinson's biggest mistake is that he left actually lots of evidence lying about. At the time, the technology didn't exist to do anything with that evidence, but as time goes by, technology develops and then they could catch him. The other great irony here is that Hutchinson went away kind of disappeared, didn't do anything else that we know of. But then his son gets pulled over for a, a speeding conviction. And then because of that, because of something his son does wrong, police are able to look back and find him. The biggest mistake Paul Hutchinson made was that he didn't have a crystal ball. He couldn't anticipate the advances in forensic science that would bring about his undoing. He left DNA at the scene, he left DNA on that paper towel at the pub, and of course, there was a fingerprint on the letter. Those who loved Colette Aram finally saw justice done for the teenager who had high hopes and a life ahead of her. But that will never bring her back. Beautiful, quiet, kind and uh, giggly. <laughs> Her giggle. I'll never forget that giggle. It's still her giggle is the the one thing that has never ever. It's it's so clear in my mind her giggle because it, it was slightly different, but it was it made you smile. <laughs> <laughs>